Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's virtual parlor chat, a conversation and poetry reading with Roberto Carlos Garcia. Um, we are especially excited to uh, be co-sponsoring this event with Word Up Community Bookshop. And um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time this evening talking about the intersection of the work that we do at our historic house, uh, Morris Jumel Mansion, um, with the community outreach and social justice work of Word Up and uh, Mr. Garcia. Before we get started um, and go over our run of show for this evening's chat this evening, I wanted to ask everyone if you would participate in a minute of silence. Um, today, we reached a very sad milestone in this country. Over 400,000 Americans have died from the COVID pandemic. Um, so we would like to think of them for a minute of silence, followed by a poem from Roberto. Thank you. This poem is called Elegy Hidden Inside an Ode to Beauty. The minute we are born, death starts ticking, and for the longest time, we can't see it. Mommy, it's the sheen. It fools us all. I ran my hands through the grass and weeds today and told my landscaper to make it beautiful or to kill the weeds. He told me his brother is in jail for six months. At least it's not years, I said. Mommy, he'll miss the summer and face two winters back to back with no respite. There are buds on my grapevines so soon. The citrus tree did not recover and chickweed have taken over the yard and I'm staring at one spot under the beech tree where I'd put out a chair for you, half in the shade and half in the sun. You will not see it again. Today, after ordering the weeds killed, I sat at my desk. My youngest daughter walked the dog with my mother-in-law. Mommy, you do not know her. But after, she rumbled into the room and smiled. I have a surprise for you, puppy, and gave me a dandelion. Thank you. So tonight's conversation is going to be a little bit different um, from our usual virtual parlor chats in that uh, it's going to be focusing on, instead of focusing on one particular aspect of the mansion and the neighborhood and its history, um, having a conversation about the weight of history and the present moment that we find ourselves in. Um, as many of you are probably aware, uh, 2020 was um, a very historic um, 
time period with uh, efforts to fight for social justice in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the pandemic, uh, a federal election, and indeed we are on the eve of uh, the presidential inauguration tomorrow, which is one of the reasons why we're holding tonight's virtual parlor chat, not on our usual third Wednesday, but on Tuesday. However, certain things about our format, the way that we normally conduct these, um, still remain the same in terms of uh, we are recording this webinar event um, as well as live streaming it on Facebook. So as some of you may have noticed, when you've entered this Zoom webinar space, your video and audio are automatically turned off. Um, by remaining in the meeting, you are granting your consent to be recorded. Um, and this is particularly the case if you choose to share your comments in the Q&A space or for the last, min the last 10 minutes of tonight's program starting at 7.50 when we open up the conversation um, to a general uh, question and answer session. Uh, you will have the option to raise your hand if you wish uh, for one of us to call on you uh, to ask your question in person. If you have any technical comments or questions, please use the chat for that space. Um, the first 40 minutes of tonight's event will be a conversation between myself and um, with Veronica Liu from Word Up. Uh, she will introduce tonight's main speaker, Roberto Carlos Garcia, who will share some prose and poetry pieces with us. Um, and in between, uh, we will pause to take one to two questions from the audience chat. Um, we also, uh, do our utmost at Morris Jamel Mansion to keep programs like this free and accessible um, to our immediate community, as well as um, community members across the country um, and beyond. And if you are able to make a donation tonight, um, we would ask you to consider making a gift today to ensure that we can continue to offer programs like this, as well as outreach to schools free of charge. Uh, below you have a few options. If you wish to text MJM to 44321, we will also have information in the chat as well, if you are able to um, donate this evening. And for your troubles, um, any donations above $20 will receive an autographed copy of Mr. Garcia's current volume of poetry, Elegies, from which he will be reading tonight, as well as a little nod to Lin-Manuel Miranda and Hamilton, uh, a Love is Love t-shirt. Um, so again, uh, this could be yours. Uh, and I also would just like to briefly highlight um, in reference to the pandemic, one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to invite Roberto and Word Up to, to speak with us um, this evening is because each in our own way is, um, each in our own way is grappling with aspects of uh, the pandemic and coping and acknowledging those uh, whom have who we have lost either to the pandemic or before. And I would urge you, if you have, if you are in the Washington Heights area, to please um, come by Roger Morris Park outside of our um, mansion, historic house, to see Covita homage to victims of the pandemic which is a public art exhibition by local artist Andrea Arroyo to honor um, those who have passed. Next time we're going to be talking about George, uh, George Washington shown here um, and we're uh, with our friends at Francis Tavern Museum so be on the lookout for that and without 
And a little brief note on historic accountability and the need to be honest about the past and to have those hard conversations um, in order to move forward in the present. And for those of you who may already be familiar with Morris Jumel Mansion, we are the oldest surviving house in Manhattan built in 1765. And if you can see here on the left-hand side, um, the house became a museum under the auspices of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so while reflecting on history, we reflect upon the history of this building, of the land upon which it sits, and the need to acknowledge the forced dispossession of the Lenape and other native peoples, and this need to confront our heritage and move beyond uh, the namesakes of the mansion, the Morris and the Jumel families, um, and the centering of the narrative upon, you know, wealthy white families whom, in the case of the Morris family, were enslavers, um, to talk about other stories and histories of the house, including uh, William Lee who was George Washington's enslaved valet, who was with him at the mansion during five weeks in 1776, during the Battle of Harlem Heights, as well as connections with, um, in Eliza Jumel's time, the Northup family, um, Anne Northup and her children lived in the house while working to repatriate um, her husband Solomon whose uh, enslavement is chronicled in 12 Years a Slave. And to expand the time frame to include more recent luminaries, such as um, members of the Harlem Renaissance, such as Paul Robeson. So again, we are undergoing this um, process of historic truth and accountability. And that is really setting the stage for tonight's conversation. So I am going to pass um, the, the proverbial microphone over to Veronica from Word Up. So Veronica Santiago Lu is the founder and general coordinator of the collective that operates Word Up Community Bookshop, Libreria Communitaria. And she serves as the executive director for Seven Stories Institute. Prior and concurrent to that, she was the managing editor, then senior editor for more than a decade at Seven Stories Press, where she currently contributes as an editor at large. She cut her teeth in bookselling 18 years ago and in publishing 16 years ago as co-founder of Fractious Press. And my favorite part of this biography, which I did not know, in 2019, the office of the Manhattan Borough President declared February 28th, Veronica Santiago Lu Appreciation Day for her arts and civic work, including Word Up. Please join me in welcoming Veronica to tonight's virtual parlor chat. Hi everyone, thanks for having us here. Uh, thanks for inviting Word Up. Thanks to Megan and everyone at Morris Jamel Mansion for inviting Word Up to co-sponsor this event. Uh, we're really um, excited to be collaborating on this with you. For anyone here who has never been to Word Up or isn't familiar with it, I'm gonna do a brief introduction. Um, Word Up, we're a bookshop and an art space and we're run by local residents, uh, most of whom are volunteers. And we're found just a few blocks away from the mansion, 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street. We also have a little stake at the mansion. There's a wagon that uh, came about in the first few months of our time um, in 2011 as a pop-up shop. And the a wagon that you can take a book, leave a book um, and when we started, we were a pop-up shop and then uh, lost the space after about 15 months. Uh, and 
So while we were without a home for about a year, this wagon was housed at Morris Jamel Mansion, uh, who's continued to graciously host it um, through all kinds of weather and ways that the, the wagon has looked. Uh, so thank you for that too. Um, we are an unusual brand of bookstore. Uh, we're legally structured as a nonprofit uh, with the mission to provide books to communities that don't otherwise have access to them, whether that be due to socioeconomics, geography, language, uh, lack of representation, which means that, you know, you don't know that, you know, it's not as much of a given that you feel like books, bookstores, literary spaces are for you. Um, as a group, we're committed to preserving, building a neighborhood in which all residents help each other to live better, informed and more expressive lives, using books as an instrument of reciprocal education and exchange to empower um, our community as a whole. Uh, so pre-pandemic, what did that look like? Our storefront was open every day. We sold used in, uh, new books in English and Spanish. We hosted all kinds of events, uh, readings, talks, open mic, story times, um, workshops. Uh, people were in the space all the time. Uh, and we also hosted and organized events offsite, uh, like the Uptown Kidlit Festival in Inwood Hill Park. Um, our collective is made up of local residents, uh, mostly from the neighborhood, and you know we have a lot of youth involved, um, a lot of lifelong uptown residents, and some who just moved here. It's the mix that we love most, um, and we want to be a space for everyone. Uh, but you know, to in order to be as accessible as possible as a literary space, we have to do our, our best to keep in mind those who are often underrepresented and underserved in such spaces and in the literary field of publishing, reviewing, book selling, because neighborhoods don't have bookstores. Um, so, you know, we focus first on the residents of um, Uptown NYC, Wash Heights, Inwood, the Bronx, but we also really aim to be accessible to youth, the Black and Latinx community, queer identifying communities, communities of color, um, and other lesser heard voices. Um, once the pandemic you know, kicked up, we closed our store to browsing and have been closed ever since to browsing. Um, but, you know, we moved all our programming and everything online, um, our, our book sales, pushed the census, helped with emergency food distribution, collaborated on marches and actions and did as much as we could outside. Uh, virtually, we helped organize a, a summer camp along with Morris Jamel Mansion and hosted a community and continue to host a community fridge on the corner of 165 and Amsterdam. Um, you know, our sidewalk has been home to all kinds of, you know, food drives, coat drives, voter registration since we've been closed. Um, and today for the very first time, you know, speaking of the Manhattan Borough President, um, Gil Brewer, uh, as Megan mentioned, today we started a whole new, you know, side of Word Up that we've never experienced before, but we partnered with the Manhattan Borough President's office to do COVID testing at the bookstore. Um, so that took place today and it will happen future Tuesdays um, until the numbers come down because, you know, all of this is connected. The reason that we focus on all of these other things in addition to books, centering books, but in addition to books is because it's all part of a healthy life and all the reasons that make books inaccessible to some communities are the same reasons that, you know, all of these resources are so inequitably distributed. Um, and so, you know, you can find us online, find out more at wordupbooks.com. There you can order books, sign up for our mailing list, find out how to donate or become a sustaining member, see what events are on deck. Um, you can also follow, like, share, tag us at Word Up Books. Um, and why are we here tonight? I mean, we're here because of, you know, because of the stories, because of history, knowing it, sharing it. Uh, we're neighbors to the mansion, so we're generally invested in what's up there. Um, and because, you know, we've been become more, you know, became, been a more frequent touch because of the summer camp, um, you know, we've been talking a lot more and you know, as neighbors do and Megan had asked for suggestions to complement um, some of the programming with the Covita project. And I had just seen that Roberto, um, who was a poet I'd come to know through an event at the shop, was putting out a book called Elegies. And, you know, everything I read about the book seemed so just like in the sort of just right. And um Roberto's work too you know the when Roberto did the event at the bookshop it was with um two other other authors poets uh, poet and author and the 
my kid was all over the place though you know <laughs> i think my kid was trying to move a, t a chair to sit next to roberto while he was <laughs> presenting and roberto was so patient um, i didn't even get to experience the actual reading because it just like went nuts but um that's the good thing about books you can take them home and read them later and i really really loved uh black maybe the poetry book that was presented that night um, and so I've been following him and, you know, ever since. And one thing that I also noted um, through just seeing his work um, is his advocacy work. You know, he's been a real champion of indie presses. Um, and, you know, that is so much of the roots of Word Up, the roots of my own, you know, time and books. And that it's such a harder, harder thing to, to find, you know, kinship with in an age when Amazon has become such a default, like lifestyle even for people. Um, and that that difference is is it becomes really is, it becomes murkier to parse. But um, I've always found Roberto Dalt to be as the in his own work, both as a, as an artist, but also in like the actual work he does in in publishing, to have really um, pushed that. And I and I've appreciated that a lot. So to to introduce the guest of honor. Um, Poet, storyteller, and essayist Roberto Carlos Garcia is a self-described sancocho of provisions from the Harlem Renaissance, the Spanish poets of 1929, the Black Arts Movement, and the New Yorican School, and the Modernists. Garcia is rigorously interrogative of himself and the world around him, conveying nakedness of emotion, intent, and experience. And he writes extensively about the Afro-Latinx and Afro-Diasporic experience. Roberto's third collection, Elegies is published by Flower Song Press. The second poetry collection, Black Maybe, an Afro lyric is available from Willow Books. Robert, uh, Roberta's first collection, Melancholia, is available from Javena um, Barva Press. His poems and prose have appeared or are forthcoming in Poetry Magazine, The Breakbeat Poets, Volume 4, Latinx, Bettering American Poetry, Volume 3, The Root, Those People, Rigorous, and Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, Gawker, Vera House, The Ascentos Review, Lunch Ticket, and many others. Um, one of my favorite parts of his bio is the founder of the Cooperative Press, Get Fresh Books Publishing, which is a nonprofit corporation. He's a native New Yorker. He holds an MFA in poetry and poetry and translation from Drew University, and he's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Very, very honored uh, to, to welcome Roberto to this event. Thank you so much, Veronica. Uh, I appreciate that tremendously. And I can't stress enough, y'all, we need to support our local bookstores, um, in particular, those like Word Up that are embedded in the community. Um, and that is their main focus because, you know, sharing stories uh, is what communities do, right? It's what families do. So definitely please. Um, get out there and, and if you're uptown, bet support your local bookstore. If you're wherever you are, get out there and, and do that. So I'd like to start uh, tonight with a short prose piece. Um, you know, and then if you guys got any questions, you can you can fire off a couple and then we'll get into the, the poetry. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I found interesting as a kid is that uh, my grandmother loved Ronald Reagan, right? He would come on, uh, I see people in the chat saying, they want some culture, where it is born, it's so cold too. <laughs> when it's cold like this, some culture con arroz blanco, forget it. Um, uh, anyway, uh, my grandmother just loved Ronald Reagan. You know, he would come on TV and do his little speech and she would be like, ay, Reagan, Yo adoro ese hombre, you know, and I always found this funny. I mean, she loved Bill Clinton too, but uh, you'd be hard pressed to find any uh, African American, Afro diasporic, or Latinx, uh, you know, group of folks who didn't love Clinton. You know, she really had no interest in the the Bush presidents. But you know that that uh, mommy, as I call my grandmother, because uh, she raised me, and you know, she is the mommy in these elegy poems that I read, right? Uh, that mommy loved former President Ronald Reagan was hysterical to me, you know, because I could still remember the news footage of when Reagan uh, went to the Bronx in, I think it was probably like 1980, 1981, you know, and people were just trying to like get at him and talk to him. And he was so overwhelmed 
by what was going on. Um, you know, and they basically booed him out of the borough, right? Um, you know, a lot of folks that we knew hated Ronald Reagan, though. You know, they didn't love him in the same way uh, that my grandmother and some of her friends uh, loved him. You know, they had the benefit of being assimilated into American culture and knowing some of America's history. They knew about his years as the governor of California and what he did there with um, not just the Black Panthers, but you know, the African American and, and Mexican community there, right? And, you know, this came back to me because recently I saw the clip of Reagan being run out of the Bronx in Gretchen Hildebrand and Vivian Vasquez 2018 documentary, Decade of Fire, right? And a few years ago, as I walked into the first day of my spring semester English 101 class, I'm a professor, I took attendance Excuse me, and there was a young Nigerian American man named Reagan, right? Sitting a few feet away from my desk, right? And I asked him if he was named for the former president. I said, is your name Reagan because of President Reagan? And he said, yes, you know, and he was, of course, he was laughing hysterically, you know, and I was like, well, why? And, and he, you know, he said to me, it's strange, right? To meet a Nigerian with the name Reagan. And I was like, well, you know, nothing is really strange these days, but it is interesting. And he told me that his parents also loved Ronald Reagan. They loved that president, right? And so there I was again, you know, scratching my head at this notion of people of color loving a president who, you know, waged war on the poor. There's no other way to say it, right? He stereotyped the poor and the working poor and even though the number of people who were committing, you know, fraud against social services was really a minor number, you know, he inflated the effects of that, that fraud to the great detriment of the poor. But yet, there was a large group of folks, you know, who loved him. Why was that? Well, upon signing the Immigration Reform and Control Act, Reagan uttered the following words. The legalization provisions in this act will go far to improve the lives of a class of individuals who now must hide in the shadows without access to many of the benefits of a free and open society. Very soon, many of these men and women will be able to step into the sunlight and ultimately, if they choose, they may become Americans. The bill basically made any illegal immigrant who'd entered the country before 1982 eligible for amnesty. So like my student Reagan's parents, my family benefited from this bit of legislation. But here's President Reagan's paradox. He waged war on so-called welfare queens and he stirred up resentment against the poor, cut social programs and social safety nets for so-called lazy Americans, while at the same time creating a unique opportunity for what is called illegal immigrants, but we don't really like that term, right? America, and by extension, capitalism is extremely creative in the ways it makes us all complicit in each other's suffering, the way it works to pit us against each other, because these two policies, one official, one unofficial really kind of created a, a tension between these groups and furthered this myth of the lazy minority to a lot of the immigrants who were here trying to fix their status, right? As we inaugurate a new president and close the presidency of the most corrupt, the most unqualified, and arguably the second most treacherous president to have a hold office, I say Andrew Johnson is probably the worst because he basically allowed the South to rebuild itself exactly the way it was after the Civil War. We are again licking our wounds. We are asked to heed calls for healing and unity. And that this isn't the America anybody except for Blacks, Latinx, Muslims, Asians, and Natives recognizes, not to mention people who are differently abled and the mentally ill and the LGBTQ plus communities. We recognize this America. No one else uh, seems to recognize it. 
Meanwhile, the pandemic rages on killing thousands daily. And yet American voters went to the polls and gave President-elect Biden a Democrat controlled House and Senate, even if it's only by one tiebreaker of vote in Vice President-elect uh, Harris. Any doctor knows that a wound doesn't heal by ignoring it. Healing takes the right medicine. And any parent knows that taking your medicine means learning a lesson from your mistakes. And that if America chooses not to teach the insurrectionists and the politicians that supported them a brutal and just lesson, the wounds will only become gangrenous and kill the patient. In this moment, we must not allow our wounds to kill us. We fought too hard. We shift the pressure now to Biden and Harris and the whole social political economic system. We continue pushing for universal health care, for a green economic plan that prevents any more damage being done to our planet, for free college education for all Americans, for a law that asserts directly and unequivocally that Black Lives Matter and that police officers will no longer receive qualified immunity a refugee amnesty program for our brothers and sisters from South and Central America. We must find all the children separated from their parents under Trump. An immediate amendment clarifying that hate speech is not free speech and neither are Nazi nor Confederate flags. And a tenfold increase in economic support for the arts. And that's just to start with. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful reflection of, of the present moment in time which we are in and, um, and the historic legacy that we, we carry, um, whether it's for us at a historical site or within families um, and political allegiances or you know, just even rhetoric that we've been immersed with while growing up that we kind of absorb, um, which frames our way of thinking. Um, and Francie um, in the chat um, wanted to add some perspective to, um, to your piece. Uh, she wrote slightly over 377,000 recent immigrants based in New York voted for President Trump in 2021. That represents 5% more of the New York vote than uh, what he received in 2016. Things are never what they seem. Um, yeah, to my point, um, there's, a, there's a narrative that is very easy for new folks to our country to slip into. And it's uh, it's largely uh, many times an anti-black narrative, but it's also an anti-poor people narrative, because most folks that come from immigrant populations, in particular, let's say uh, Spanish-speaking Latin American countries, um, you know, are dealing with different poverty conditions, so that the economics here, uh, compared to what they've experienced, are just you know better. And so they can make something out of very little. Whereas Americans uh, here, born and raised here, are promised a kind of piece of the American dream. Um, but you know, we all understand that that does not come easily uh, because of the inequalities and the disparities that exist here. So part of their, our challenge um, to ensure that politically uh, immigrants who come here use their capital in ways that benefit um, the whole is a kind of education on what those iniquities are, um, you know, and how we can go about remedying them so that their voting power, you know, gets put to good use for the children that they have who are born here and whose uh, vision and views of, of what their lives as American citizens should play out like are more in tune with the folks, you know, who were probably born and raised here. And nothing is ever like 100%. Um, there's, there's so many variables, but yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, before I came to work at Morris Jumel Mansion, I um, 
used to enter into conversations of immigration with visitors around the world um, at the Tenement Museum. And so some of those points that you were bringing up as far as the American dream and the opportunity through hard work to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, we would get into conversations of, well, my ancestors were able to, why is it that, you know, more recent newcomers have not. And so, you know, it was really interesting to see sort of that mythology of America that we're all kind of steeped in um, with essential portions of the narrative left out. Um, so, you know, native people who are still here, <laughs> whose land we are all on mm -hmm. um, has yet to be acknowledged. Um, and the fact that um, enslaved Africans were brought by force here. So where does that fit in this immigration narrative? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, how are these sort of the foundations of our countries continuing to reverberate and playing out today? Yeah. And also the story of Irish, Italian, Polish, uh, Eastern European, um, Jews, Russian Jews, and Jews from uh, Ukraine and these types of places whom uh, were basically treated as just kind of one step above uh, freedmen, you know, and folks who were uh, still enslaved, who were economically exploited and allowed to, you know, die of hunger and freeze to death in tenement buildings. You know, capitalism also took a ginormous dump on those folks as well. Yeah. But the narrative gets rewritten to frame them in a certain and their experience in a certain light that does not tell a true story and and connect how we are all more alike than we are different and how our experiences are more similar uh, than they are different. Right. With that, um, if you would like to share one of your poems with us. Sure. So um, this collection, uh, Elegies, is a series of elegies <laughs> for, largely for uh, my grandmother who passed away due to complications from Alzheimer's disease, but also, um, you know, for other folks whom we've lost and for other times and experiences. And so uh, this poem is called Elegy in which I dream of us under fruit trees. I was writing at an old splintered table under an apple tree. Apples kept falling all over and there were other trees, orange trees, pear trees, avocados and fruits kept falling. Mommy, you entered through a door I hadn't seen before. Look at all this fruit, I said. Look, mommy. Here, try some. You ate from my hand and we laughed, but I was anxious. I had to get back to my writing the page iridescent. You cupped my face and said, escribe mijo, vete, and folded your skirt and filled it with fruit. And I watched you walk out the door as I wrote and wrote and wrote myself awake. This next poem is called Variation on Lines of Dialogue from Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. And in the movie, uh, Bill Murray says uh, this line, he's talking on the phone, and he goes, well, what if there is no tomorrow? There wasn't one today. I used to ride on the back of Miguelito's bike, not pulling on his shoulders as he pedaled. Back then, even the burning skulls of dead apartment buildings seemed beautiful. We never said, thought, or dreamed tomorrow. Today replayed every day. No matter how often I opened and closed the fridge, one ketchup packet, one egg, one carton of OJ, three days expired, and this hunger, this, this hunger, this ringing of guts and dry tongue. What the fuck was a tomorrow? Back then, today was three for 20, two for 10, red cap, blue cap, let's make a deal. I need four chicken wings and pork fried rice, this is real. I know what you're thinking. Groundhog Day is a comedy 
And this poem sounds like your favorite rapper's first album. It's true. I'm the metaphorical caterpillar cocooned and emerged a butterfly and it's beautiful to flutter in sunshine, everyone pimping. My predators are wasps, snakes, lizards, and parasitic flies. The joke is Bill Murray reliving the same day again and again. Good people, we ain't no joke. We are sharing the same stories, songs, and poems over a span of decades, same but different. Again and again, rewind, har har hardy har har, are you not entertained? I should have been an exquisite corpse. My yesterdays are my today, every day. I can't trust tomorrow. Wow, that one, I actually am curious to know, were you inspired to write that during the pandemic or prior to the pandemic? Because it seems to really resonate with where many of us are um, right now. It began before, but the revision process kind of took its time just around through the pandemic, right? Hmm. Yeah. Because uh, especially your last line, my yesterdays are my today, every day. I can't trust tomorrow. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's this kind of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. That we are, we are caught in. Um, you know, how, how, I'm curious to know as an artist, how your writing sort of informs, you know, your pandemic experience. Is it, um, do you find that where we are now gives you an opportunity to be even more creative and prolific, or do you find the opposite in some ways? <laughs> it's, um, the experience is this is similar, um, I guess to to everyone else's. There's this, uh, you know, it's interesting. My my grandmother used to have this word in Spanish. She would say incertidumbre, right? And uh, it's kind of like uncertainty, but it also has this kind of tinge of dread with it, right? Um, and so someone else asked me this question, right, for an interview um, about how my life as a writer kind of informs this experience and you know part of my answer was that there's no separation you know there's not like okay writer hat and then dad hat and then professor hat and you know it's just it's all one I look at the world as a writer I go in and teach as a writer I parent as a writer right and one of the things that um, many writers learn to do you know is to watch right to just to watch and so it's difficult for me to answer this question in a way that i think would be satisfactory because i'm still watching mm. right i'm still watching um and boy is the world giving us a lot to look at oh my <laughs> right um and yeah. so i'm watching and processing and just kind of staying present mm. uh, so that I don't get kind of swept away by all of it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so I think that's the best I can answer that right no, now. No, I mean, I, 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 I appreciate your, your thoughtful um, you. reflection on that. Um, and, and I also um, appreciate your point about it's not easy to segment yourself into like, this is my writer hat and this is <laughs> yeah, my, yeah. because our identities are composed of many facets of our life, which inform the other facets. And that capitalism wants to compartmentalize everything. Yes. Um, and it wants us to be these compartmentalized individuals when, you know, we have one mind, one heart, you know, one soul. And so, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. Um, so Wanda, 
um, in the chat. Well, first of all, she she gave um, a shout out to you as a, a fellow Garcia. <laughs> yeah, I saw and, that and I replied. I'm like, you know, yeah. we, we be those good people. <laughs> and, and proud to be a Dominican American. No doubt, um, no doubt. He's um, she shared, um, first she said, thank you. Um, for the poems, I had goosebumps. I'm wondering if you could share how you start a poem. Do you think of a story or get an image or a first line? So what's your process? So, um, you know, whatever it is that it comes, whether it's a memory, whether it's something I saw that started me thinking about something else. So for example, excuse me, um, this poem uh, on Groundhog's Day, you know, one of my friends, uh, she's a poet, her name is Lynn McHenry. She really likes that movie Groundhog Day. And um, she gave us a prompt, like a writing prompt, right? Uh, surrounding the movie. And I found it so, this concept of a Groundhog Day so interesting um, because one of the things that kind of torments um, those of us who are fighting for equality and equity um, in the face of whether it be police violence or the violence of, of capitalism is that over the decades, it's the same stories being repeated, right? Um, just different, different people in different decades. It's always updated. And so it immediately got me thinking about that right? How we repeat these stories, right? Um, and so that idea, based on that prompt, kind of gave birth to this poem, right? Or gave birth to the revision process of this poem. But whether it's a memory, whether it's a dream, whether it's a conversation or something I saw, the most important thing is to just write it down how it is. Just get it all out on the page. Doesn't matter what it looks like, sounds like, just keep writing until you're like, okay, I'm done writing right now. And then take a couple days and leave it alone and then come back to it. And that's when you start to play. What I say play, right? It's almost like uh, when you're given a toy as a child, right? And at first, you know, you're, you're looking at it, you're taking out the package, you're like this and that, and then maybe you put it down and go to another toy you're more comfortable with, but eventually you come back to it and you're like, okay, I'm gonna play with this toy. I'm gonna see what it does and your imagination takes over, right? And so that's what you then do in the revision process is you start to play and you see what, what comes of it. Where can I take this, you know? Maybe this will work and if it doesn't, oh well, I'll try something else. Right. Until you start to get, you know, as good a feeling as you can get about it, <laughs> because there's also that anxiety, right, um, about when is a poem done or whatever, you know. So, yeah, um, I guess that's the best I can answer that that question right now. It also reminds me of um, one of those many, many quotes attributed to um, Mark Twain, <laughs> whether in fact it is not, but that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm, yeah. It's not exactly the same. Right, but there's parallels always, mm -hmm. there's always. And if he would have said it off rhymes, that would have been even more perfect. Oh, so, so explain what you mean by off rhymes. So a rhyme, you know, is book hook, right? Book look, right? Mm -hmm. Hook shook, right? An off rhyme is almost like uh, if you say take clock, right? Kind of rhymes, but not perfectly, right? And so history is like that. Mm. It looks very similar, but there's always subtle differences. It updates mm. with the times and what's going on, right? So, yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'm thinking in um, respect to time if um, perhaps you could share um, another poem with us. And then I think tonight's conclusion, um, after we take a few more questions from Veronica and others, I think if we close with Elegy for All of It. 
Sure. Okay. That would be great. So this is a. Uh, uh, one second. To a young man on his first period. The way my matriarchs sat at the table that morning is a panorama in my mind. Tia Nereida sitting cross-legged, pushing back the hair from her forehead and holding the cup in meditation. Mommy cradling un cafecito with one hand, her other arm across her chest, hand resting on her arthritic shoulder. And my big sister Judy, for whom not enough Platano Maduros existed in the world on that morning. And I was welcomed as a hero when I sat down to eat my frosted flakes. Apurate, papi, pa que vaya la bodega. A $5 bill pushed at me. Acuérdate, Cotex, okay? Cotex, no tenga pena. At the bodega, I passed the purplish blue package. The bodeguero looked at me long and hard. What's up, macho man? You good, hombre? And older boys walked in and saw and hungered. I know what that is. Open it. Give me one. And there was no way. So a fat bloody lip, two scraped knees, and a head knot later, I made it home. The package unopened. Judy pinched my chin up to see my lip. Did you get yours in too? Did you fight back? She ran warm water over my lip. And I nodded, yes. Bueno, she replied, in this life, we all got to bleed sometime. As Marina says in the chat, I loved this poem. Can Thanks, speak, Marina. <laughs> can you speak to toxic masculinity and how poetry and writing helped you overcome or wrestle with it? Oh, definitely. And that's a great question. Um, one of the things that reading opened up for me was to question why structures or institutions wanted me to believe what they wanted me to believe. What was the point of that? Whom does it benefit? Right? Um, whom does it benefit that I don't want my girlfriend to talk to other boys uh to give me her beeper back then because we all had pagers let me see who's paging you um whom does it benefit if i'm uh, a machista right if i'm full of this patriarchal masculinity if i'm homophobic right um if i'm kind of zealot about you know, the Ten Commandments or certain religious rules, right? What does it serve? Um, and reading and just coupled with life experiences really uh, opened my eyes to the structures in the world and what behaviors or what forms of programming, right, or norms that we are uh, acculturated to support, right? many of which are detrimental. And so the point is to try to figure out, you know, whom does that serve, right? So for example, um, one, of the, one of the most disturbing things to me was when I first experienced the kind of racism that uh, where I'm talking at the the level the way I'm talking right now, and somebody is saying to telling me to calm down. Why am I angry? Why am I shouting? And the confusion tied to that, like I'm not shouting, you know, I'm not angry. I'm talking, but them presenting or viewing me in that way was was like a you know it's like a shock, right? Like what kind of programming in them makes them have to see me in that way, right? As a threat. As Sure, as a threat, as uh, not human, 
what kind of dehumanization process in them makes them see another human being as less than that, right? And so, um, yeah, reading, personal experience, uh, and then taking those things and, and applying them with, you know, critical thinking or, or, or whatever have gone a long way into to helping that. Yeah. And it's a constant struggle because yeah, the world, I mean, the world is, the world wants me, it invites me and other men to constantly be misogynistic and homophobic. It invites men to do this. It rewards men for this behavior. So we constantly have to be looking and wondering and questioning and checking ourselves and, and, and to have good people around you who'll do that for you as well. Right, people around you who also keep you, hold you accountable. Yes, definitely. It's very important. And I'm even thinking, you know, when you were mentioning this idea of being angry or too emotional, it's like, as a woman, mm -hmm. how many, how many of us have heard that directed our way as well, or even going yeah. back to, you know, uh, running for president and the inauguration tomorrow, that you are somehow inherently not fit to be a leader by virtue of mm -hmm. who you are. And I would argue that just by looking at the history, men have proven more than enough times that they are not up to the task of leadership. <laughs> <laughs> or as That's, my mom said, give women a chance. Um, they yeah, can't do any worse. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so um, I have one more question that I would like to share from Veronica. And then um, uh, I also want to give a shout out to um, Carolina from Word Up. Um, as well as Tyler, who uh, is our ASL interpreter for this evening, um, to thank you, as well as Nadia, Veronica, you, Roberto, um, and all of our audience for, for joining us here tonight. Um, Veronica's question is, has your work publishing affected how you write or how you edit yourself? Um. Anything I think I read always helps me look at the world in a different way. So, you know, when you read, when you take the time to read what someone writes, you you walk in their shoes and, and those experiences, um, yeah, they stay with you. So I think they've definitely um, given me new vantage points, right? Um, it, helping folks revise their manuscripts um, and just talking through manuscripts with folks has helped me in my revision process for sure because you're working out a muscle right and the more fit that muscle is uh hopefully the better the the result of what it's producing so um i'm going to say it's it's definitely helped for the better there is always that um you know, what is the fatigue, right? You read and read and read and read, and then eventually you just don't want to read and you don't want to write. That can happen as well. So you got to really balance it. But it's definitely been more helpful than hurtful, for sure, or than harmful, excuse me, for sure. All right. Uh, well, thank you all once again. Uh, for joining us for tonight's virtual parlor chat. And Roberto, if you could conclude the program um, with Elegy for All of It. So this is a longer piece, if you recall, right? Yes, I do. It's worth okay. staying for, but we do understand it's 8.02. If you need okay. to hop off, we will be sharing a recording of this shortly on our YouTube page. Okay. Elegy for All of It. Sometimes, if I catch a white person staring at me as I hop in my car, I imagine them calculating whether or not I need reparations. I mean, they don't know I'm Afro-Latino. To a white racist, black is black, which is true, but not in the way they think it's true. 
I was almost done eating my beef and broccoli when a white woman strolled into Chow's walk and ordered a pint of plain white rice, please. Just white rice. I heard the owner ask, nothing else? She repeated, just plain white rice, please. A short standoff ensued, very short. Should I take your money or spit in your face short? The proprietor shouted the order to the kitchen. Shortly, the white rice and the money changed hands. My daughter Lily brought home a Black History Month project. I love baseball, so she chose Jackie Robinson. She read me the short story she was given about Jackie Robinson's life. Jackie Robinson was the first black man to play in the major leagues. In order to play in the majors, Jackie had to control his anger. Pause. I flip ahead. I flip back to the cover. I flip through the assignment instructions, but there is no explanation as to why Jackie Robinson had to control his anger. No racist white ball players, no racist white fans in the stadium, no segregation in baseball, no racism. Institutions will erase racism from history, but be racist every single day. The Monday after Tamir Rice's murder, many white people I knew went on with their lives. Their social media feeds a mix of ironic humor and smiling faces and anything but Black Lives Mattering. I hit like on some of them, waited a few minutes and hit unlike and let that hang in the air. Hopefully they struggled with what that meant. The day we learned of Alton Sterling's murder, I ate a long lunch with a white friend, maybe two hours, and they never brought it up. The next day, Philando Castile was murdered and they never brought it up. It went on like this for a while. I counted. Dear reader, I've heard white people say, I don't know, I didn't want to get too heavy. Laugh out loud. At these times, I think of, insert white celebrity getting rich off black culture here, patron saint of white silence. Dear white reader, we're being slaughtered catch as catch can. By all means, go back to your daily dose of internet video. We watch men and women level buildings, superheroes we call them watch them explode planets and kill millions. We watch for entertainment. It tastes good to us. Walking around Times Square one day, a Buddhist grabbed my wrist and tied a bracelet to it. He offered me countless blessings. He said the bracelet would protect me and he gave me a little rolled piece of parchment for good fortune. I asked, what's the catch? You see, we're building a temple, he replied and we'd like a donation of 10 or $20. I honestly had no cash on me. I apologized. He quickly untied the bracelet, took back his parchment and left. That's capitalism. In poem for Yusuf Hawkins, Felipe Luciano writes, when black people march back to the sea, they're taking America with them and no one will be able to stop them, amen. In the drawing, the execution of French soldiers, Haitian revolutionaries are hanging the titular soldiers well into the background for miles and even up into the mountains. The drawing is black and white, but the sky was certainly Caribbean blue and the sun had to be cooking that wool and silk uniform. Sweat and rope burning the neck flesh. If you look closely, you can see a kind of frenzy on the Haitians' faces. What a spectacular way to end your oppression, to change places with the lash master who just the week before probably beat the blood from your skin. Spectacular. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Stephen Clark, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Amadou Diallo, Kenneth Chamberlain, Jonathan Farrell, John Crawford III, Jordan Edwards, Botham Jean, 
Atatiana Jefferson, Eleanor Bumpers, Alberta Spruill, Sandra Bland, Tony McDade, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Katherine Johnston, Deborah Danner, Khalif Browder, Trayvon Martin, Edmund Perry, Jose Garcia, Henry Dumas, Michael Stort, Randolph Evans, Jordan Davis, Rayshard Brooks, Yusef Hawkins, Oscar Grant, Freddie Gray, Sam DuBose, Terrence Crutcher, Jamar Clark, Jeremy McDowell, William Chapman II, Eric Harris, Akai Gurley, Carlos Ingram Lopez, Sean Monterosa, Jose Soto, Israel Hernandez Lack, Elijah McLean, Magdiel Sanchez, Daniel Harris. Every year of every decade, there is a list. Remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.